I think it just comes down to, to, to one day at a time. And our focus really is relationships over revenue. And I think when we treat people well and with dignity and respect and encourage them to sort of pursue what, what they're passionate about, I think that does change the world. I think that's the, I guess it's cliche of like the butterfly effect, right? Like it's that, that's, that's it. And I used to think that, um, you know, I guess as a, when I was younger, I had loftier, a loftier vision of what I might be able to impact. But then I'm recognizing now as I get older, it's like, I think it's just that it comes down to relationships and having the deepest impact on the people that I spend my time with. This is another episode of the Automate and Grow podcast. My guest today is Jim Coleman, and he's the co-founder of Xfusion. Jim, thanks for being my guest today. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Appreciate being here. So for people out there, what is Xfusion? Yeah, so we, we provide outsourced customer support. We started with SaaS businesses, but now we provide support to, to just sort of any startup. We're, we're, our initial focus, like I said, was SaaS, but we, we're branching out from that. And uh, effectively what we do is we provide a, a full-time dedicated agent that works um, in a focused way on our client's product or products. And we have layers of, of leadership and management on top of that. We also provide customer success as well and, and kind of back office support. Um, so we, we run into to founders often that um, need one, like don't quite need one full-time person, but, but um, or they might be transitionally, like they need maybe 3.5 people or something like that. So we also provide support services. So any sort of like back office administrative support. Like for example, one of our newest clients is a WordPress hosting company. So we provide support for them, but also site migrations and other kind of technical back office tasks. So what start, you know, like what caused you to start Xfusion? What was the big yeah, problem? That's a good question. I, I got into entrepreneurship back in like 14. I, my previous experience was in law enforcement and specifically as a detective. Um, and I just made a, a big career change and started with like local service companies and, and sort of one thing led to another. And I, I had an opportunity to partner in a small SaaS called GrooveJar. And through that that process, we actually ended up selling the company. The The broker that bought the company had a, a SaaS um kind of a, a SaaS portfolio that then they hired me to, to operate. So that's what kicked off the process. And then I, I met my co-founder, David, who was a previous Uber uh, developer. So he bought one of the SaaS assets that, that my company was selling, that the company I worked for was selling. Uh, and then he consulted with me to kind of put together a team. So long story short, he and I worked really hard to build an internal team uh, for, for his product and, and my product as well. And in that process, we had worked with another um, sort of a competing company that their model was different in that they had a, kind of a per response model, wherein like one agent may be working with four or five different clients. And it's fine in the sense that like, if you have a founder that maybe needs just very, very part-time support, but it was difficult for us to, to work with them because we felt like we had to police the team to make sure they were giving attention to our inbox. We thought like, well, we're wasting a lot of time policing the team. We may as well in, you know, build our own internal team. I so just, we did that. Yeah, we did that. And we thought, gosh, like we, we can, I think we can bring a better product um, that, that allows the agents to focus in a dedicated way on, on a, you know, a per client basis and just offer a, a better customer experience for our customers. So we launched that, I guess, externally, officially in May. Um, oh, wow. And I, yeah, I've been pleased with, with, with our growth so far and, and kind of where we're at. Um, so what was the experience like launching in the middle of... Uh... I will say the pandemic response as opposed to the actual pandemic. <laughs> well, if you ask my that's wife, kind of a weird time out there, right? Yeah, totally. If, if you ask my wife, it was scary as hell. You know, like I, I'm more risk averse than she is, and it it she's a big supporter, like a huge supporter. But like it took some convincing because like I had a stable job, W two income, oh, okay. and we had this idea and we wanted to take advantage of it. You know, and it's like and I, I had my like side side SaaS business, but like it wasn't producing a, enough of an income. Uh, to sustain us. But anyway, like we saw this opportunity and we thought, let's just go for it. So certainly it was very scary to make that leap, but we've actually found that like SaaS, I'm sorry, that uh, COVID has been beneficial for like the e-commerce and SaaS world. And we got our start mm -hmm. supporting Shopify app business owners. Uh, and, and we still do like that. That's been our, our kind of focus initially. We've, we've branched out since then, but uh, that worked out really well because like, uh, if you look at like Shopify's performance over this early COVID time, it's just crazy, crazy. just insane. <laughs> Yeah, so the volume of, of tickets for Shopify app owners just exploded and they, they had a definite need. Uh, so we've seen that. And then we've also seen just an increasing level of willingness for, for founders to allow their staff to work remote. 
So what we've actually found, like some of our most recent clients, like we're integrating as part of their larger team and they've gone remote. So they, they kind of graduated from like in-office to remote. Then they thought, well, if we're remote, why don't we consider, you know, working with an, an outsourced company to facilitate our support needs versus us having the responsibility of hiring internally. So I don't know, like, I don't know what will happen in the future, but like so far I've been really pleased and, and I feel like we've been really fortunate with, with like the positive side of COVID and the way it's, um, it's helped us grow. Well, particularly if you're on like the Shopify e-commerce space, I can see totally exploding in the last like six months for obvious yeah. reasons. And- yeah. I was talking to my wife this morning. Like I, I haven't seen the, the stats yet, but I imagine this year is going to be a, a, a record-breaking year for e-commerce sales. It's got to be like, it gotta just be. makes sense. Yeah. So, that's interesting. So, um, you know, you haven't started it that long ago. What's the process like of, I guess, well, first of all, what sort of support are you providing? Is it telephone? Is it email? Like, and then how do you get up to speed on all these different businesses? Yeah, no, that's that's been uh, something that we've kind of figured out along the way. But we provide phone, email, and chat support. Most of our clients are just email and chat only, but we do provide phone. We provide it 24-7, 365. So we, we have the ability to cover uh, all time zones. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's been an interesting process to kind of kick, kick that off and... and um, we, we've worked predominantly with staff in Nairobi, Kenya, in the Philippines, okay. and that's been an interesting process as well. We found some amazing, incredible people that have just been a blessing to us in terms of like their um, their, their work ethic and, and ease of working with them, and, and it's been it's been really awesome. One of the things that we do differently is we pay about thirty percent higher than our clients, and we're really going. Uh, I'm sorry, than our competitors, and we're really going for sort of the the upper side of the market. Um, people that that prioritize quality over over cost got it um and then like so i guess you know why are like some of these e-commerce guys or other companies choosing to go this route as opposed to building out their own team yeah i think i mean there's pros and cons and when we have calls with people like we we're very open with just talking about the pros and cons because it's it's not um it's not always just like a slam dunk idea. It depends on the, the founders and what they want to focus on. The idea is that, that we want to give founders back their time. So where they can focus on the highest and best use of their time versus like if, if support is their thing, then great. If it's not, then we provide a solution that helps them get back to, to focusing on their highest and best use of time. And thus far, that's been technical founders for the most part, that they're really, really good at the tech side. They're not as good at the like relational side, whether it's you know customer success or customer support. Um, also, there's just the, the cost involved. I mean, hiring someone in the, in the U.S. is... Uh, considerably more expensive and then just facilitating the, the payroll process is difficult. Um, but one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is, is finding quality, um, you know, talented resources in other countries. And we have a really thorough hiring and vetting process and we only hire maybe 0.5% or so of oh, those wow. that, that apply. So um, that's a, a tedious process. And we have an, an internal, we call it a, a boot camp training period that the agents go through. So there's just a lot of legwork like that, that, um, I, I think that, it, you know, for the right person, it makes sense to do that yourself. But for a lot of people, they found that we bring a lot of value. Um, and then we implement, like we integrate with their team. So we have two different types of customers. We have the one that's maybe a, a solopreneur or, or they have a small team and they want us to just completely take over their inbox. And we can absolutely do that. And then we have other teams that maybe are 25 or 50 people already. And they're wanting it to add us to their existing team to scale. Um, or to kind of take over that side of, of the business. So it just kind of depends and we, we can do both. Um, and they're both a little bit different, but yeah. Have you, are you finding that you're, you know, you're adopting a bunch of different platforms, like whether it's CRM or customer success platforms, or, or do you bring yeah. those to the table for yourself? Like what will... No, that's a good question. We, we, we have to be flexible. I think I missed one of your questions earlier. I was trying to remember. Oh, that's right. I might've missed it too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, like whether we work in different platforms and kind of the, the training process. So we do ask our clients to provide the initial training because they know their product. And then one of the values that we bring is we, we provide all of the future training. So if they start with one agent, they would train that one agent. We have a team leader in place to oversee KPIs and make sure that everything's going smoothly. And then as we scale or as they scale, we can scale with them and we provide all the, the training from that point on to additional agents. But but as far as platforms, that's been interesting. Like We have experience in the you know Zendesk, uh, Help Scout, Intercom, et cetera. Um, and we don't, we don't interact with, with CRMs as, as much. Um, but it's interesting that our most recent client, like I said, they're a WordPress host, they handle all of their support on Slack. 
Oh, it's really? a really unique, they use a, a tool called Slask, which is a chat widget on their site. And then they actually give their, and they, they have like a higher LTV customer base. So they'll give them a dedicated channel within their Slack. So if they ever have an issue, they just ping them directly. And when I, when I first talked to, to our new client, I thought, gosh, that's really novel. Like that's really, really interesting. And I was a little bit hesitant on like the scalability of that, but it really works for them. So we've been able to adapt to that and, and make it work. But it's, it's a unique approach. So my point is that, you know, our, our clients use a variety of different platforms and we just kind of adapt to whatever they're, they're using. Oh, that's great. So uh, what's the future for Xfusion? What are you trying to do and where do you want to go? You know, we, we, you know, you and I were talking about this just before we, we started, but like, we like the idea of um, creating time. Like we, we want to, you know, obviously the mark of a successful business is profitability, but there's much more to it than that. Like David and I are very passionate about creating a, a culture and an environment where our team is well taken care of. We really pride ourselves on, on paying significantly above average and just treating our team really, really well. And we want them to operate as owners. So our model is one that's really, really lean. In fact, we, we're doing our best to operate um, with like very little middle management. We basically have the, the, the agents on kind of the ground level. Then we have team leadership. And then we have David and I, um, and we handle sales and operations. But the point is where we give our team leaders a lot of autonomy and we expect a lot from our team. So we don't use like screen tracking software. Like we, we expect them to operate at a high level and we, we hold them to those expectations, but that creates an, an environment of autonomy for them. So um, yeah, like, I mean, we, we, the goal obviously is, is to grow, but I mean, we're, we're chasing time freedom and you know, you and I sort of pre, That's pre we're talking about Warren Buffett. We were talking about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, we, we were talking about Warren Buffett and how he has so much, you know, it seems like he has free time to read newspapers and books for five hours a day or whatever. So it's like, I don't know. There's, there's value. There's value in that. Like I, I like the freedom of being able to talk to you right now and not have to like, you know, report somewhere at a certain time or whatever. I, I appreciate that flexibility and the ability to build relationships. And we had, we, Dave and I had a call just before you and I talked this morning or before we started our call. And the guy just like saw, saw me on a, a podcast, saw Dave and I on a podcast and he just wanted to reach out and, and chat. So like, it wasn't a sales call. It was just like, Hey, let's connect. He's another founder. You know, just awesome. Like to have the, the freedom to talk to him for an hour, like that's incredibly valuable to me. And money just doesn't like that. Money just doesn't live up to that sort of, um, I don't know. I just don't get as much joy um, from just raw dollars as I do the relationship component. Oh, that's interesting. Um there's one other question I was going to ask you. Like, oh, so are, how do you find or how do customers find you? Like, are, are, do you have like an active sales process? Are you just doing no. you know, kind of PR through <laughs> podcasts? Like what's been successful for you? Yeah, that's one of the things we were talking about this morning. It's like, I, I think it's been helpful to recognize how much we don't know. Like, and just to be humble with the idea that, look, like <laughs> we're just experimenting. And I, I was telling the guy I talked to this morning, I said, I, I went to a, a SaaS conference back in, um, I think it was 2019, which feels like forever ago, but in the spring of, of 19. And the guy that sold Grasshopper, I think his name is David. I don't recall his last name. But he sold it for something like 60 million, 30 million, like a, a ridiculous sum. And he was talking about the process that he used to build Grasshopper. And he was basically saying, hey, we used paid media, a dollar in, $2 out. Like it worked for us. Like we figured it out and it worked for us. But what I learned from that is like what works for him then is not necessarily what will work for me now or for, for you now. I mean, we have all of these changes and you know, notwithstanding COVID, of course, but even outside of that, like, I think that I believed for a long time, there was this certain recipe. If I could figure out the recipe and just employ it, that would work. But now I'm realizing that there's so many nuances that it really just comes down to experimentation and seeing what works. So we're, we're bootstrapped, but we, we do have some funds that, that we've invested in experimentation. Uh, and some things are working out well and some things aren't, you know, like we, we, we spent 15K for a three month experiment with a, an outsourced SDR company. And unfortunately my, my co-founder is asking for a refund today because it's just been horrible. Like, and not, not that we were expecting a certain result from them, but just the performance has been bad. So th the point is like, we've just kind of thrown spaghetti on the fridge and tried to see what sticks. It's such a tough, you know, thing to figure out today. And I think that we get, you know, there's two things informing and I've, I've always had a challenge with this. Like, you know, we've got our past history of how we found customers and yeah. our knowledge of maybe if you know if you have a sales background that training but it's almost like we got to like almost just forget about all that <laughs> <laughs> like no just you know look, look how do we talk to people 
<laughs> I think I think we underestimate good fortune. And so to give you an example, I, I used to to work for the the M and A firm, and I would be involved in the the SaaS acquisition process. And so we would buy and sell. And one of the businesses we were looking at at buying, uh, the guy was selling a content business, and the guy was selling it because he like he had found success with that business, and he was going to sort of double down on that process. And the business was was making money and growing rapidly. And from my perspective, I'm like, dude, why would you sell? Of course, I didn't say this, but like, why would you sell that? Like, I think that we have this assumption that because we're successful one time, we can replicate that. Mm. And, and that's just not, it's just not always the case. You know, like, I think that it's more helpful to have kind of a, a humble approach and say like, you know, let's just, let's see what works. And in our case, like <laughs> we've, we've sent out like cold emails that I'm sure like from cold email experts are pathetic or whatever. And they're kind of long form copy, but it's just so far it's come down to like the timing, you know, it's like we offer a service that they're hungry for and the timing is, is necessary or, or impactful for them. And so we get on a call and then we have a chance to, to build a relationship and get to know each other. But like, I just, I, you know, I chalk a lot of that up to just right place, the right time and good fortune. That's just def definitely an, a, a big part of it. I, it, it's really interesting because I think it's a conundrum because like, you know, we get in this robotic thing about creating a system to acquire customers. And in the end, you know, you're kind of reorienting me to think like, listen, it's just about think of how you can help people and talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> how do I talk to I, them when I can't see them face to face unless it's by Zoom? Maybe yeah. that's the question we need to ask ourselves. <laughs> it's fun. And like I previous to like my primary role aside from operations at Exfusion is sales. But I don't I don't have a sales background. It's like I just, you know, I just like do what I do. And I like to talk to people. Like I really appreciate having an opportunity to speak to people. And like most of my sales calls are like, if it's an hour long sales call, it's like 50 minutes talking to them about their life and their product and their experience and all that. And, and maybe like 10 minutes or less on our solution. It's like, yeah, like they want the information eventually. But the point is there's such value in just making that human connection. And I just so enjoy that process um, that, I mean, it's led to sales, I guess, uh, in spite of my inexperience with, with sales. I think that's actually probably the best takeaway that I can have from that. It's just a good reminder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, just how do I meet more people and have conversations with them? So I like that. That's yeah. Because yeah. eventually the it, other part will take care of itself. I, I agree. Like I'm, I'm confident in our product. Like we really stand behind what we do. So I don't feel like I need a hard sell it. You know, it's like if, if someone wants a more affordable solution, that's okay. Like I'm happy to talk to them still and, you know, see where I can be helpful or whatever. But like, it just, I appreciate being in that position. That's what I'm saying, like we were talking about earlier. You know, it's like, once we get to the, the point of having a certain amount of, of money that it gives us that freedom, then th that it alleviates the pressure. It's like once, once we have a salary from our, our business, uh, so yeah, like, I mean, who doesn't want to make more money? But the point is like, I, I don't feel the pressure to close a deal. Like I'm more worried about serving our existing clients very, very well. And if, if our products are a good fit for a new client, then that's fantastic. But I don't feel the sense of needing to pressure them into anything, you know? Yeah, I don't think that works really anyway. But <laughs> no, I don't, well, I said this too. I, I, I had a conversation with um, Brandy Chastain the other day. I don't know if it, from the U.S. Women's Soccer famous goal. Oh, I missed that one. I watched another one. Uh, it's that. not up yet, but okay. I, I don't know how it came up, but I was like, well, you know, when you try to force things like with people, it's like the saying that I always remember growing up was, "A, a man uh, convinced against his will is of the same opinion still." <laughs> That's a good one. I think it reminds me of. I, it's um, been resonating in my brain. Like, <laughs> yeah, like it reminds me of. It. There was a a book. Oh, I think it's called Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. Oh yeah, um, the guy's amazing. But but he and I'm gonna butcher this quote. But he said something to the effect of like the 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 best car salesman ever said. Like he was interviewed and, and they asked him like, why are you so successful? And he said, because I'm always focusing on the second and third and fourth sale, not the first one. Like, dang, that makes so much sense. In other words, like he wasn't pushing people into like the more expensive car or whatever. He was caring about them as a human and their needs and what they were wanting. And that allowed him to be so successful over time. It's just, it's just, a, it's a, it's a paradigm shifting idea. And it's just like that, the long game, right. Versus that short-term win, you know, kind of cut off your nose despite your face sort of thing. That makes total sense. Um, now you mentioned one thing that I didn't want to forget to touch on was you were a detective. <laughs> yeah. That was another life. Uh, yeah. I, it's it's been a crazy journey, but yeah, I was a, a patrol officer and then a sex crimes against children detective for five years. Oh no! Um, so that was man, that was tough. I, That's I, tough. I would yeah. still there's this. I guess totally off topic, but there's there's such a shortage in 
I guess, resources in the law enforcement space to be able to proactively investigate these really heinous cases that I would love to come alongside law enforcement someday and can have a, a nonprofit way where we can provide additional resources. So, like, and I think this, circum- this, this goes back to business in the sense that like, I, I'm motivated by a big why like that more than revenue. It's like, yeah, money is important, but like, it's ultimately not that fulfilling. Whereas something like being able to like, what can I do with the money that I can generate? And like, we're off to what I feel like is a good start with Xfusion. And I like the idea of being able to generate the level of revenue where I only need to live off of 10% of that. And then the rest we can employ to, to do these things that I think would be impactful in the world. Oh, that would be a great mission for sure. And that's definitely a, a challenging area that we all have to kind of pay attention to because we got to protect kids, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, my wife and I are really passionate about serving children. We've we've fostered and adopted for a, a long time. Um, I should say we've adopted and also fostered for for quite a while. So um, yeah, I mean, that's something that like, that's that's the type of thing that is motivating to me. Like, I mean, there's bad days in, in business where, you know, I just butcher a sales call or, you know, we, we disappoint a client and need to, you know, go, go backwards and like, make sure we repair that and, and fix that. It's like, there's days that are just hard, but stuff like that is just so motivating and, and keeps me going. It, it's an energy source. It's just a lot deeper for me than, than money alone. Well, I applaud you for that. That's, that's an interesting background and an important long-term mission. So I concur with that. That's really important that someone continues to focus on those things. And if your business can help fuel that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, do you mind if I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. I'm curious to learn more about found, Founders Pack. I was I was looking just ahead of our call, and I, I see that from your LinkedIn, you started that like fairly recently, right? This yeah, year? Yeah, pretty new. So what's the story with that in COVID? Because that it seems like that might be a challenge in light of COVID. So my idea behind Founders Pack is that it's really a vehicle that I can help uh, a million startups over 10 years in some fashion with their startup journey. And so at the most basic level, it's like connecting founders with other founders. Um, I've created a free startup and grow course. So people can go through and self-study and learn how to rapidly prototype and validate startup ideas and decide, is this a business or not? Because I think there's a lot of missteps around both technology and you know, there's not enough talking to customers before you have a product. Um, yeah. So I, th- that, that's kind of what the material is. We did our first pitch event in November. And we had nice. David Meltzer, Arabian Prince, and Roger King as the judges. Okay. And we had five awesome startups. The next one is December 15th, so I'll invite you to that. Uh, awesome. The plan is to continue to run pitch events in uh, once a week in January and then hopefully scale up by March to two a week. And the we've turned them winner takes all. Okay. What happens is the, the companies each have a $100 entry fee and then the winner takes the pot. Okay. So they get a, nice. they get a $500 check spend visa card and whoever wins it but it's also a great nice. opportunity for them to get comfortable with making a tight pitch and answering questions to real investors and advisors and i just really believe that entrepreneurs change the world so i think that you know we have so much static around politics and the reality of politics is not going to change anything i don't think that monolithic solutions to anything work and yeah. we all get caught up in those things. But I think in the end, if you look at the people that are real change makers that are solving problems on a daily basis, it's entrepreneurs. And so I would just want to be, I want to work with more of them. I, you know, I usually advise three or four at any time, but this should give me an opportunity to work with like hundreds. And that's really what my goal is, is to help have more yeah. impactful ventures. And when I say impactful, it's like, you know, we, we see people that build stuff and it goes nowhere. Or we see people that try things, but they don't validate it enough and they build the wrong thing. So I want to try to help people get on the right page from the beginning or course correct, and then build stuff that will scale or meet their lifestyle and impact other people. That's awesome. I, I'm curious, like, what, what are you seeing as the predominant cause? When someone, you know, kicks off a startup, maybe they're bootstrapped, they don't have a lot of funding, and they go out of business in one year. Like, what, what do you, is it the lack of sort of early vetting product market fit? Like, what, what are you seeing so. as the cause? I think that's part of it. I, I don't. I think that we think in very linear terms, and it's not always linear. <laughs> but I think that yeah. you know, to shorten your cycle, it's like you always start with an idea. Can you tell that in a concise way? Yeah. I think um, I was talking to a friend of mine that has a, a VC fund, and he said, you know, the big thing he sees is founders are the problem, which is they either are sales and they want to sell something, but they don't understand product and technology, or their technology they don't want to sell at all. And so I think that there's always that gap and you got to have a, some sort of balance to at least give yourself a chance. 
And then I think people go off and they build stuff thinking they can throw money in and get a developer. And that's a huge mistake because what you need is this is a product and it has to work and look and feel a certain way. And getting that right is very important. And then being able to actually sell it. So I think you have to get uncomfortable, be able to pitch it before it's something, be able to show it before it's something and be able to sell it before it's something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of the idea of like uh, of partnerships. And I know that that's a, a sticky topic for a lot of people. In, in my past, I've had multiple business partnerships and they've all been successful. And I define successful as we, we've consistently gotten along, been on the same page and have, have met our goal, whether that's an exit or, or like, you know, one of us coming off or whatever that is. And we're still in contact today. So that's been really fruitful. And, and David and I are 50, 50 partners of Xfusion and he has a much more technical background. He's a former senior developer at Uber, uh, like Berkeley grad um, in computer science and just a way smarter awesome. guy than I am. And like, he's totally <laughs> like in that world, like he's, he's incredible, but we have, we have complementary skill sets. And, and we're really on the same page with like the, our big whys and in, in the direction that we're wanting to go. It's like, that's been fruitful for me. But like, have you seen, have you seen other, probably, would you, do you suggest to the, you know, the, the young entrepreneurs that follow you that they embrace a partnership mentality or are you not as much for that? Um, so, you know, I'm writing a second book, the first one being automate and grow, but the new book's called form your own pack. And that's really the methodology around founders pack and what i'm what i'm suggesting is that uh we learn from the japanese karetsu model which is to okay. form cooperative ventures and part of that is having your own mastermind and mentors and then in your own organization but then also having other entrepreneurs that support you so whether you're you know ideally you've got the technical and the business figured out in your business but you can also learn from these types of conversations and having okay especially if you have a couple of ventures where you have cross shareholdings, you share technology, talent, data, and relationships. And then you also have this instant mastermind of the founders. So maybe you are not a technical co-founder, but you listen to people you trust mm -hmm. that are a little more objective. And I think that's the other big blind spot we have. Um, so I, th I think partnerships can be tough if you don't have both sides of that coin. Um, I think just know that if you're not a product technology person you either need someone you trust that is yeah. or know that you don't just go and hire a developer because it's more complex than that it's got to yeah. be design ui ux front end yeah. back end and are you building the right thing for the right purpose <laughs> yeah and get, you know, one, one get of lots of feedback <laughs> yeah it, it reminds me of an idea that so when i was at um at the, the broker that I, I worked for i would like I said vet these businesses and that was a, such a unique opportunity to sort of look underneath the hood. And I, I recognize that like, it's very difficult for us to have a 30,000 foot perspective in our own business. Absolutely. So when I can look at a prospectus and interview the, the owners of a business that the, you know, they're trying to sell, I get this unique perspective that is gone once we get into the weeds of the business. So I was very careful to really like document all of the ideas and, and like processes, things I wanted to uh, to implement or, or to, to try or whatever, because I knew that when I was in the weeds of that business, it was just, it's just gone. So I think from that perspective, it's really helpful to have, you know, as a good friend of mine and previous business partner says outside eyes, right? Like someone that's so important. Yeah. And, and, and like we, Dave and I've benefited a lot from kind of, uh, well, mastermind groups. So, you know, there's kind of loose connections that, uh, or, or loose groups from our, from our connections that we have, but that's the idea, right? At least to give each other outside eyes Absolutely. on our business. And that's why that's that's where the title of Form Your Own Pack is. It's like you gotta have that yeah. because it it can be it can be an isolating journey, but it can also that can be very dangerous because you can go you can tell yourself stories and not get yeah <laughs> any. I think it's <laughs> oh, that's a good point. On dark alleys, right? Yeah, now, I think vulnerability is another really important aspect of that, and like checking our pride because it's hard. Like it's, you know, people go on podcasts and different things like, Oh, I'm, I'm amazing. I've done this, but like, it's, it's difficult, but so important to be just real and vulnerable you know, in those types of networks and support groups, because otherwise like the, the quality of the help you're going to receive or guidance you're going to receive is going to be dependent on the vulnerability that you're willing to exhibit. That, that's a great point. I think that um, there is an aspect of people who start businesses because they have an idea and they're motivated by that. And that, um, if they're willing to just stick with it and pound it out, they're going to be successful, but they can also screw up because of that. So I think, you know, not relenting on your vision and how you're going to deliver the solution, but being able to evaluate that outside 
input and treat the business as separate from you if possible. Oh, that's a good <laughs> point. You hit it on the point where you're like, the pride gets in the way of all of us, right? And it's like, if yeah. it's going bad, I'm a terrible person. If it's going well, I'm a genius. Yeah. And I think if we can say, this is, a, way. this is an idea, this is a problem, I want to solve it. And I can objectively say how to get there. And I'm willing to experiment within these bounds mm-hmm. that I think that's what we were talking about before with Warren Buffett, which is he's got this very practical way of breaking things down. Yeah, It's, it's a tough skill, but it, you know, it's helps if we reinforce it too, by talking to people like this. Yeah. So yeah, be objective, pull yourself back. I see this. Don't be threatened by this input. Yeah. And take it for what it is. <laughs> totally. So do you have in-person plans post COVID for Founders Pack? Well, so we originally, the first Founders Pack live event was supposed to be March 18th. <laughs> That's and, I, and I had partnership with WeWork, great right? because I had launched oh, my okay. first book with WeWork, and I was going to all the WeWorks. So okay. that's why I, you know, I was procrastinating, and I said, "Listen, I just got to do this online." So the on the pitch events are the way to connect initially. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know about the right platform. We're we're going to announce probably I think a partnership with uh, Entra. Okay. And they are um, they just crossed ten thousand users. Michael Mara, uh, I just recorded an interview with him as well, so it should be out by yes. the time this is out. They are kind of like a entrepreneur focused app and network. So think of LinkedIn, but only entrepreneurs. So um, I think that's the right platform. And we have a similar mission around entrepreneurial education and other education. So I think maybe that will be the home where it's like, you know, form your pack and have a platform that you communicate with. I've found just chats. Like I set up a chat with, you know, three or four other people that have businesses and we're complimentary. It's not that we have the same customer, but we can kind of bounce things off each other. And sure. that's super helpful. But I think it, I think that's kind of what I'm thinking is like, there probably won't be in person ever again. <laughs> that's yeah, the world I'm preparing I, for. <laughs> I, I hope not. Like, I, I think like post vaccine or herd immunity or whatever, like, I think we're going to have a significant bounce back. I, I think there's this like, I was just like one of our new clients, the, the guy that's our, our point of contact there, he and I were chatting this morning and he had a little icon on, on his desktop that said, cruise 2022 <laughs> so that's like hey, so i noticed funny. that like, oh but like him and his wife are planning for a cruise it's like i just we're going away still i mean we're you know we're going to miami for new year's i don't care it's like you just gotta move on like yeah yeah and we we, we went out to colorado to see a few close family members recently yeah. it's like i get that but like I, you know i, I the I widespread it's changed yeah. everything i mean it's yeah. the reaction to the thing that's changed everything <laughs> yeah for sure yeah it's been so difficult to navigate. I think we're all just collectively very done with it. There's a lot of benefits to being remote. Yeah, true. I mean, I've always been remote, and I'm like glad that the rest of you have caught on. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I'm excited. Yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> welcome yeah. to my world. Like, yeah, oh, you guys know, know what scene. Zoom is now. I'm excited. I don't have to explain yeah. it anymore. <laughs> exactly. You don't have to teach people how to log in and get set up. Um, I, I, I think that one thing that might happen is like a, a hybrid approach where I could see like like offices that that share like two or three tenants and you get like a, you know, two days a week or three days, one week to the next sort of thing. Cause I I can see like there's value in in in-person connection and kind of collaborating in person. But I think most of us really prefer the flexibility of remote and autonomy of remote. Isn't that ironic that we work with so maligned and having so much trouble and yet really that could be the model. And I I think that you see, you know, spaces that are, people are starting to finally being forced to re-contemplate like malls. Like, uh-huh. you know, That's right. e-commerce boom has turned some malls into distribution centers, right? Yeah. So it's like, no, this thing's dead, shut it down or I'll take this giant part of it and it's a distribution center for Amazon or Macy's yeah. or Walmart. I, I think that uh, one of the shared visions I have with Michael Mara from Entra is that there's going to be school campuses that are bankrupt. There's going to be malls that are bankrupt. And what those need to be is get students in there earlier. Let's get them mm-hmm. at 14 or 12. Yeah. Give them a different type of education that's not about monolithic, you know, bad incentives that lead to debt and something that doesn't yeah. exist anymore. Stop teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. Create these places where you can identify creatives versus um, engineers versus totally. designers versus entrepreneurial type people. Uh, whatever that stream set is, and yeah. then let them help them create stuff. Right. Like help totally. them so that, you know, at the end of four or eight years, whatever you choose, let's reimagine the campus. 
But yeah. one that's interesting to me is I don't know if you followed Kanye West's Yeezy campus. No, I, I'm familiar with him, of course, but I, I'm not. I've not fam- followed that. So it's re- it's really interesting, worth looking into. But he does a great okay. interview with GQ, and he's bought like twenty four. I'll call it twenty four hundred acres. Okay. For the first Yeezy campus, and it's like reimagining spaces, and it's a similar idea where he wants to create these like flowing spaces where people go and create ventures or projects or learn. And um, is it Wyoming? Wyoming is the first one. Oh yeah, because he has land up there, right? Or is his it's crazy? But so like, family, so, yeah, it's great. And it's such a great interview. But I think people like huh. that, like you know, he's a difficult guy to listen to sometimes because the way he communicates and thinks, it's not typical. But what he's producing is really interesting, and I think more of that needs to happen. We just need to st- sidestep this system of bad incentives, and so that would yeah. be my goal. Is like then it's a connection between to your point it's not about he's he's he says it really interestingly he goes you're born and you're in a box and we put you in another box which is a crib and then you go to another box which is a school so that you can then go get a job which you're in another cubicle which is another box so you can buy an actual crib which is another box and we have all these square spaces. And then when you die, they put you in another box. And then we do it all over again. He goes, I want, uh, I yeah. want something with more flow and creativity. <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting. Kind of interesting. I, I love that idea. <laughs> there's, a, there's a book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree that I've been reading or listening to an audiobook lately. And one of the things that they mentioned in the book, and I, I can't cite the source of the research or whatever, but it was, it was uh, they did research into valid Victorians and kind of where they're at in life. And, and almost all of them grow up to be, quote, successful employees, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. they were kind of saying, like, does this path lead to, uh, you know, sort of the people that have changed the world in an entrepreneurial sense? And the answer is it does not, because they learn how to be rule followers, how yep. to check boxes. Like, and I recognize that we need a, a certain percentage of people in, in the world like that. But the, the thing not is, everybody. like... Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just not adapting from the old industrial age. Like, Oh, my God, we're, we're so far off path. <laughs> Yeah, it's just not how I think it's like that's gonna catch up to us. This goes to what you said, which is you don't know why you're successful. And you also Mm -hmm. don't know why you're failing. Yeah. Which is that you think that the reason you're not successful is because you haven't conformed enough, because that's what those systems have taught you. Yeah. Whereas the people that are creative and do some people like get mad at influencers or YouTubers, it's like, no, they get that we're in a digital economy, we're in an attention economy. That's don't, right. Why don't you? Why are you teaching something else? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting, Michael. On a similar note, like I've I've purposely restricted my diet of consuming, and it's funny because I mentioned like two books on this podcast, but like I, I've I've restricted my diet of of media in every in every type and consuming books and like trying to figure out like ex entrepreneur says to do this or that. Because like for too long, I just read and read and studied and studied and never actually implemented. And we've had the most success just freaking doing it. Like just right. making the best of like, because I think That's like it. Dave and I are reasonable people. Like we we've, we make reasonably good decisions. So it feels like, like, okay, like I, I don't want to be prideful and say like, I don't have something to learn because that's not true. But there's a point where it's just time to experiment. And it's just time to like, the rubber meets the road. We've just got to try this and make the best decisions on the fly and recognize that every business is so different that, you know, what works for person A will not necessarily work for person B. Well, and I think that's my goal. You know, we see a lot of, again, very monolithic approaches to trying to shape the outcomes in in the economy. And some of it's really bad right now. Like it's, yeah. you know, the approaches are very blunt instrument to the point where it creates disincentives for people that are creative because now you're being evaluated on something that's not what you're, your ideas are or your output. And right. what I want is 330 million different outcomes. Totally. Like yeah. you're in a place where you have an infinite world of possibilities. And what you choose to do is to fall into one of four Plinko boxes is not a good choice. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That would, it would be neat for, for founders packs. Like, I don't know if eventually you're going to get to the point where you're working with really young entrepreneurs, like even, Probably, yeah. even high schoolers, right? Like people Maybe. that are just like, I mean, I just, I think that's so, it's so amazing to have the opportunity during the formative years of, of a young person's life to kind of shape the direction or give them opportunities. That's one thing David and I have talked about, like with our staff even, is like we want them to be successful and entrepreneurial and we want to support their ventures. So like it's and it's hard. Like if they're a freaking great employee and they're gonna to leave to to pursue an entrepreneurial adventure, like that's hard for us from a selfish perspective, but it's better for the world. It's like, if we can impact them in a positive way, especially in these countries like, you know, Kenya and in the Philippines where like, maybe they don't have as many opportunities that, that we do in America and we can help them along that journey. 
and hopefully give them some skills along the way. That's that's super impactful on a much larger scale than what we can just like the change we can affect within our own business. I love it. I mean, I think those are young countries where people are hungry for the sort of framework that we're in right now. And I know there's a lot yeah. of people that are rebelling against that framework and trying to label it of, you know, well, I'm not in the end, when you boil down, I'm not successful because of you is not what America's about. Like I came to the United yeah. States from Canada to mm-hmm. get away from those types of restricted opportunities. The, the thing that we've always liked about Americans is that can do screw it. I'm going to make it happen. Uh-huh. That's yeah. the ethos that I think is really special. And I think people around the world look at that. And in the end, that that's some form of entrepreneurship or another. Sure. Right. Whether it's like yeah. entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, it's taking initiative, thinking of your own outcome. And I think that's the opportunity it's before people. And I think people get scared by that and they get bad information yeah. and we should, we just got to make it so, the way I look at it is this, if you go to high school and you spent four years learning to take better and better tests and maybe getting on Adderall or getting into something that because you're sad because you can't learn math, oh. um, are you better off because you get to go to a school where you do the same thing and come out with 100 or 200 grand worth of debt? Or what if you had four years where each year you had a specific project you choose, you have a mentor and either that's a nonprofit, you start a business, you start an investment portfolio, you start a creative project, you start an engineering project. And at the end of the year, you report and show that at the end of those four years, if you have four of those versus the other system, which who's better off? Mm. Yeah, I agree. I, I have student debt that I totally regret and I hate that I have it. And like, I'm, if, if you need it, if, if, if a degree is the, the gatekeeper to what you want to do, like to be a doctor, for example, or a lawyer, like I get it, fine. I get but like the, the idea of like, Graduate and, and my two of my girls are going into high school this this next fall. Uh, yeah, next fall. Um, so like the idea that they must go to college just because that's what everybody else is doing and they have no idea what they want to do with their life and just to accrue fifty or hundred thousand in debt is so silly to me. Yeah, like I, it's wild. It doesn't make sense. I, yeah, I went to a, I went to what is a you know a pretty good school in Canada called Waterloo and there's a lot of engineers and there's a lot of computer science grads. A lot of great things that come out of there, including a great entrepreneur program that's really one economics course by Larry Smith, probably more now, but, and I, I, after a while I left, cause I was like facing like, well, I have all these work opportunities. I was in the co-op program. People kept wanting to hire me or I could start this business. So I can uh-huh. take this money and do this, or I can take, I can go over here and maybe walk out without, you know, with debt. And I'm yeah. like, I think I'm gonna go do this one. <laughs> it's funny. Like just before I call when I'm old. <laughs> Yeah. It's just for a call, Dave and I were chatting uh, and we we're talking about that. I don't know how we got on the subject, but we we're talking about degrees. And, and I told him, I said, you know, oh, like he shared, he shared a picture with me of somebody that had like some entrepreneur that had their name comma MBA. Like it was a thing. And, and it was funny because like I, I have some hours towards my MBA in Denver yeah. and I left that when I was in an online marketing class that was taught by someone that had zero experience in online marketing. And the stuff that we were learning was outdated compared to what I was actually doing. It's like, like, this is stupid. Well, and also that, like, so some of my, like my, my first business partner uh, is a guy named Rohan Gilks and he's a great guy, successful business guy. And I started out kind of like as a manager of one of his companies and when we partnered together, but anyway, like when I was partnering with him, like I literally took off the MBA hours from my LinkedIn because it was like, it was a deterrent to him. Because it's like, you know, he, the point crazy. is he didn't want those type of institutionalized type people. And I get why, because they're just, it, it's harder for some of them to kind of think outside the box because they're in that system. Well, I think that's, that's giving people the space and a framework to succeed in, in the, un, the uncertainty, mm-hmm. right? As opposed to think, yeah. you know, what I've seen is I've had various on, um, interns and they're smart people, but they don't always know how to think and they don't have initiative and they just want to be told what to do and so then they say hey i want to do marketing let's say i go okay you know in your four years at columbia or berkeley or stanford wherever you well stanford's a little different but stanford's actually really interesting but some of these other schools chapman i'm like did you okay how many facebook ads did you create Oh, we did a course on that. I'm like, did you touch the Facebook ads platform? No, no, we did case studies. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> did you create any Google ads? No. Did you create landing pages? No. Do you have a method? No. And I'm like, all right, let's, you know, you, it's like you just dropped hundreds of thousands of dollars, four years of your life. Yeah. And now they're learning the basics. Yeah. And I think that's unfortunate because I think if you just want to do marketing, 
do marketing. <laughs> yeah. If you want to totally. do sales or you want to do product development, do it. Cause there's so few barriers now to doing those things. And I think Peter Thiel had a great idea, which is, um, you know, the Thiel foundation, I think he called it. And you give people hundred really smart people. He said, go to Harvard for a couple semesters and then come back. And he gave them a hundred grand to go start something. I love that. I was actually thinking about that earlier when we were talking about this. That's, and then the, the other funny thing when you're talking about degrees, I again think of Kanye West and he's his and his albums and the one is like where he does the skit where he's like, but these degrees will keep me warm. <laughs> on the street. <laughs> yeah, burn them in the fire. That's so oh, man. well, Jim, I want to be conscious of your time. I really appreciate you um, talking to me today. Is there anything yeah, we haven't likewise. touched on, by the way, that you think is important? Oh man, we could talk all day, but no, no nothing else that we need to right now. <laughs> well, I, w- I want to, in- I want to invite you back anytime you want and I'll invite that. you to founders pack and uh, you let awesome. me know what level of participation you're interested in, or if you have any startups that want to pitch. Great. Um, I'll wrap up with a few quick questions. I won't ask okay. the one about books because we already talked about two interesting books, which was alchemy and uh, barking up the wrong tree. Right. So those yeah. are good book recommendations. Uh, if you, Jim Rohn says that you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Mm. So who do you, Jim, spend the most time with? Mm. Well, certainly in COVID days, it's, it's my family. Uh, but my wife has always been incredibly encouraging to me and supportive. So um, she's definitely been kind of the, the wind beneath my wings for a long time. And that's been really awesome. Uh, and then I spend a lot of time with David, my co-founder. He and I just super well aligned and, and get along well and uh, we, we sync every day. And some people may think that's crazy, but we talk for about an hour and a half every single day. Oh, um, it enriches our relationship and we, we go through kind of our, the things we've been working on and that's been really impactful. Um, and then there's some other local friends as well that have been just and continue to be really impactful. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, I guess the sum of, of who I spend the most amount of my time with. I love it. That's great. And I keep hearing a lot of family stuff, which is actually probably the positive part of this whole being locked down. It's true. Apparently totally. we're going to be locked down again on Monday. So Oh. Got to get in a good weekend. <laughs> Be ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. Thanks, California. Um, yeah. How are you, Jim, changing the world? Mm. You know, I, I think that, like, I have lofty aspirations that I kind of talked about. I think it just comes down to, to, to one day at a time. And our focus really is relationships over revenue. And I think when we treat people well and with dignity and respect and encourage them to sort of pursue what what they're passionate about, I think that does change the world. I think that's the, I guess it's cliche of like the butterfly effect, right? Like it's that, that's that's it. And I used to think that, um, you know, I guess as a, when I was younger, I had loftier, a loftier vision of what I might be able to impact. But then I'm recognizing now as I get older, it's like I think it's just that it comes down to relationships and having the deepest impact on the people that I spend. My- I love it. That is a wonderful mission. Uh, the you. final thing is. And we have interesting people on the podcast. We like you to nominate other interesting people. We typically talk to experts and entrepreneurs. I've been making a concerted effort to start up or talk to startup founders or SaaS founders. Uh, but usually um, the first person that comes to your mind is the best. But who would you, Jim, like to nominate and can introduce us to as a future guest of Automate and Grow? You know, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't pre-prepared for this question, but just a serendipity would have it. I talked to this guy named Rashav Kanal. He's a Nepalese guy that's been in the, the U.S. for quite a while, Virginia Tech graduate. And he has a startup that he he just founded uh, maybe about a year ago called In Person. Um, and I can I can share his information with you. But I just talked to him this morning, super gregarious young guy, like brilliant and, and very, very easy to talk to. Um, and he would have a lot of interesting things to share. Former former um, LinkedIn employee as well that kind of oh, cool. left that to, to start his own venture. So I think he'd be great. I love it. And that's, it's Rashav or Rashard? Yeah, Rashav. Um, R-I-S-H-A-V and Kanal, K-H-A-N-A-L. Beautiful. All right. So Rashav, you've been, I probably just mispronounced his name right there. No, that's correct. Rashav. Yeah. <laughs> you've been nominated as a future guest of Automate and Grow by Jim. So we will accept that nomination. Jim, I want to thank you very much for your time today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate your time as well anytime. This has been another episode of the Automate and Grow podcast. We will see you on a future episode, hopefully with Rashav, hopefully I pronounced his name right, on Automate and Grow. Mm-hmm.